Hello again, Professor Jared Rathel here. Uh, this is the first in a two-part lecture entitled The Evolution of Populations. Our primary goal today is to understand the two drivers, the two causes or sources of phenotypic variation. So remember the first observation that Charles Darwin makes about nature in his uh, descent with modification by natural selection. The first thing that he recognizes is that individuals vary. So we look at this population of ladybird beetles or ladybugs, and there's obviously all of this individual variation, variation in their phenotypes, their physical traits. So what causes this variation? Let me pose this question to you. Do individuals evolve? In other words, does an individual's traits, those traits that help them survive and reproduce, do they change during the course of the individual's lifetime? So <laughs> this happens all the time in the popular media, right? Consider Wolverine. He's this mysterious genetic mutant who, you know, one day as a child suddenly gets really angry and, and sprouts these gigantic claws to kill who he thinks uh, is his father. Spider-Man, another great example, right? One day he's Peter Parker, bitten by a radioactive spider, and the next thing you know, he's clinging to walls. So this stuff makes for great movies, but this is not the way that evolution in the scientific, in the Darwinian sense, operates. Individuals do not evolve. So, <laughs> unfortunately, no matter how much I want them, I will never spontaneously grow Admantium claws, not in this lifetime. That said, natural selection does act on individuals. Natural selection acts on the individual level. Remember, different individuals have differential rates of survival and reproductive success. I mean, let's consider Wolverine again. I mean, Logan, with, with all of that, you know, burly chest hair, clearly a man's man. Logan is going to have no problem passing along his genes. The population is what evolves, not the individual. It is populations, localized groups of the same species that evolve, that change over time. I mean, clearly this population has evolved. Wolverine has obviously contributed his genes to this population. Don't you see the increased proportion of Wolverine traits? Look closely. Those two babies. One's clawing another one's eyes out. The other one's right. Wolverine claws on top of his buddy's head. All right, this is stupid X-Men biology humor, but my point is, is that individuals don't evolve in the Darwinian sense. Natural selection acts on individuals, allowing some with their beneficial traits to better survive and have greater reproductive success. And then in the next generation, the population evolves in the sense that those beneficial traits become more common. Thus, the population is what represents the smallest unit when we're talking about evolution. It is the population that exhibits what we call microevolution or changing allele frequencies and subsequently the genotype and phenotype frequencies like you see here from one generation to the next as our population of peppered moths illustrates after the Industrial Revolution. Classic example of microevolution. So, when the monster came, Lola 
ear. Like the peppered moth and the arctic hare remained motionless and undetected. Harold, of course, was immediately devoured, and with that fa fashion sense, he was removed from the gene pool. Okay, so we recognize that individuals do not evolve, but we see this phenotypic variation. We see lots of individual variation across populations in their physical traits, from peppered moths to pandas to people. So where does that phenotypic variation come from? Consider human height. So here's a cool bell-shaped distribution of human heights from an old photograph. We've got females over on the left-hand side in white, males in black. Um, we got five foot on this side right here. So my daughter's going to be over here. She'll be lucky to crack five feet. The mode, the most frequent height is five foot six. And then out here on the right, we've got six foot five inches. So what causes this phenotypic variation? Why do humans vary in their heights? Quick look at this photograph. Obviously, your gender matters, and the underlying genetic makeup, but also, also whether or not you received adequate nutrition as a child has a dramatic impact on your ultimate height. Over the past 100 years, we see mean human height from countries around the world increasing. The Netherlands on the left is home to the tallest peoples in the world. Um, Iran experienced the greatest gain in male height, South Korea, the greatest gain in females, but we see these average gains consistently across countries from around the world in just 100 years, which is way too short of a time period to be attributable to genetic change. So what's the big difference between 1914 and 2014? The answer is nutrition. We now have a global industrialized agricultural system that is capable of producing much higher calories available per capita today than in 2014. The data are clear. Malnourished children do not attain their genetic potential for heights. Whether or not you received enough calories, enough protein as a child, is what we call the environmental influence. Although an oversimplification, you'll often hear the dichotomy referred to as nature versus nurture, where nurture here represents nutrition or the environmental influence. So here's another way to represent those height data with all these Western countries exhibiting increasing median male height over the past 100 years. If you look closely, there's only one anomaly here. Since the late 1970s, the wealthiest country in the world has actually seen declines in male heights. You see the USA here? actually declining since the late 1970s. So the researchers that collected these data point to two possible drivers for this trend. Number one, sadly, our eroding social safety net. All of these other countries, these European countries, have universal health care. The Dutch, they've had it since 1941. The United States though rich in terms of our gross domestic product, has very high rates of income inequality. So unfortunately, our child malnutrition rates are much higher than in these European countries with stronger social safety nets. 
The second driver that the researchers point to is immigration rates from Central America, like Guatemala that you saw on the last slide. Uh, the citizens of those countries tend to be shorter and it's pulling that mean down as well. Okay, so the environment can drive phenotypic variation, but not just in humans. It's across all species, and this is a stunning example. This caterpillar is from a moth called Nemoria arizonaria. It lives here in Arizona. It hides from predators by mimicking the foods that the caterpillars themselves are constantly eating. So Nemoria caterpillars emerge in two batches, one in the spring and one in the summer. But the two batches of caterpillars actually look quite different. Larvae born in the spring, like you see on the left-hand side, they develop into caterpillars that look just like oak catkins. Oak catkins are the male flowers that are on oak trees. So these guys are rich in yellow color. They've got all of these small projections. You can see that they're matching the oak catkins here. This caterpillar, same species, is born in the second wave of offspring in the summer, and it feeds on oak leaves it ends up developing uh, into a caterpillar that looks like an oak twig. So in this instance, the environment, what these two caterpillars are eating is causing radical developmental change, radical morphological change, phenotypic variation. So number one source of phenotypic variation, environmental influence. Great example, Nemoria arizonaria. The second source of phenotypic variation is the underlying genetic variation. Different alleles produce different traits within the same species. For example, whether or not you can digest lactose, the sugar that's in milk, has nothing to do with the environment. Say, whether you were breastfed or bottle fed or how much milk you received as a child, it has everything to do with your genes. If your ancestors hail from a region of the world where the domestication of the cow has been part of the culture for thousands of years, like here in Northern Europe or in places in Africa and the Middle East, then you likely have the alleles for lactase persistence. You're able to generate the enzyme lactase into adulthood, which is a really unique characteristic in Homo sapiens. But I'll let Spencer Wells explain it to you. Only a small number of human beings live like this today. But from the time our species evolved some 200,000 years ago until the not too distant past, all of us lived as hunter-gatherers. Then, around 10,000 years ago, people started domesticating animals for food, living in settlements, and cultivating crops. These cultural changes have profound biological impacts on our species. And you're about to encounter one surprising example. It has to do with a familiar food. I'm talking about milk, the main ingredient in some of our favorite things. Almost all of us can digest it as babies, but the story of how many adults can use it as a food is a fascinating case study, a study of the coevolution of human culture and biology. Mm. 
all infant mammals can digest milk. In fact, producing milk for babies is a key trait that distinguishes mammals from all other types of animals. The main sugar in milk, lactose, can't easily pass through the intestinal wall. So cells here make an enzyme called lactase, which breaks lactose into glucose and galactose. These two simpler sugars can then enter the bloodstream, where they can be used for energy. Around the time young mammals stop drinking milk, almost all of them stop making lactase. So they lose their ability to digest milk. They become lactose intolerant. What typically happens when an adult mammal drinks milk? It's not pretty. The lactose goes undigested straight through the small intestine to the large intestine. Here, bacteria eat the sugar and can cause cramps, gas, and diarrhea. It's a bad idea to offer a bowl of milk to an adult cat. We only know of one mammal species in which some adults can drink milk without getting sick. Yes, it's us. Not all of us, but worldwide about a third of adults can digest lactose. This minority is called lactase persistent because their ability to produce the enzyme that breaks down lactose persists beyond childhood, and in fact, throughout their lives. How did lactase persistence come about? Why does it occur only in some people? I've come to University College London to start my quest to find out. Geneticist Dallas Swallow will show me how to figure out whether someone can digest the sugar in milk. You're going to do a lactose tolerance test. I am. The idea is to look to see what the level of glucose is in the blood of the volunteer before the lactose load has been taken. After measuring my baseline glucose level, okay. I now have to chug a liter of milk. You're allowed to breathe in between. <laughs> it's all right. <sighs> if my body is still making lactase, my blood glucose will shoot up. After I drank the milk, here's what happened. No doubt about it, my lactase enzyme is still working. Where do your family come from? Britain on my father's side, um, Denmark, Holland on my mother's side, but kind of Northern Europe. This Northern side. Europe, OK. You can see, first of all, that most people in Europe are lactase persistent. My family background makes sense. In only a few regions is a large majority of people lactase persistent. In other parts of the world, few adults easily digest lactose. What exactly is different about people who are lactase persistent? To get a clue, researchers looked at DNA. They first compared the part of the lactase gene that encodes the enzyme across persistent and non-persistent people. They didn't find a change in the DNA that distinguished the two traits. So what could explain the difference? We know that genes, including lactase, are regulated, turned on or off, dialed up or down, by other pieces of DNA that act like switches. In search of a possible mutation in a lactase switch, a research team identified Finnish families that had members who were lactase persistent, as well as those who weren't. Statistical geneticist Joe Terwilliger was part of the team. We then looked to see if they shared DNA around the region where the gene was that we knew was affecting the metabolism of lactose. On chromosome two, in and around the lactase gene, a number of shared markers in the DNA allowed Terwilliger and his colleagues to home in on a segment of DNA likely to contain the lactase persistence mutation. By comparing this segment base by base across lactase persistent and non-persistent individuals, they discovered the critical one base difference. A T instead of a C at one non-coding position the researchers had made an important discovery. They'd found a mutation that causes lactase persistence in Finns and other Europeans. Do all lactase persistent people carry this mutation? I thought there would be one mutation, and that would be it. 
So we went off uh, to study uh, samples from Africa, and to our surprise, we found that the mutation barely existed. Was a different mutation at work on this continent? Then a young professor, geneticist Sarah Tishkoff, traveled to a number of African countries to find out. We've now looked at Tanzania, Kenya, and the Sudan, and Ethiopia. And so we've really looked at a broad range of groups, and mainly in Eastern Africa at this point. In one population, the Maasai, Tishkoff and colleagues found a different lactase persistence mutation from the one in Europeans. The two mutations had arisen independently in two different populations, in each case providing adults with the ability to digest milk. Tishkoff was more than pleased. Thrilled, <laughs> excited. <laughs> you know, you rarely, right? It's so unusual to actually find a variant that appears to be correlated with such an interesting trait. What was special about both the Maasai and the early Europeans that might explain why they each independently evolved this trait? Both are pastoralists, people who domesticated animals for food. They adore their cows. <laughs> They're very <laughs> possessive of their cows. This is their monetary system. Their wealth is determined by their cows. Their culture centers around the cow. Was the evolution of lactase persistence driven by drinking milk? If so, can we find evidence of early milk use in these cultures? In Bristol, England, organic chemist Richard Evershed is examining fragments of old pots to find out. These look like they were probably um, cooking pots like the ancient saucepan. Uh, we actually select pottery from the, from, the, from the body or the upper parts of vessels because obviously fat floats on the surface of water when you start the cooking process. Evershed has examined the fats trapped in pots from ancient settlements across Europe and Africa to determine if milk was on the paleo menu. It is quite wondrous to think that you are holding artifacts in your hands that were made and then used by people just like us. To figure out whether these pots once held milk, Evershed first had to find a chemical signature of milk fats. He started analyzing all kinds of fats from contemporary animals. We go to farms where they're using traditional farming methods, raising animals on natural grazes and pastures as far as possible. Comparing the ratios of two carbon isotopes and two kinds of molecules in fats, Evershed watched the measurements pour in. I sat at my desk with one of my students and we were looking at some data and um, we started to sort of see patterns in the data. Clustering in one part of the plot were body fats from pigs. <laughs> In another region were body fats from ruminants, such as cows. But there was more. I can remember the moment, and it's like the, the clearest day when we sat there, and there was this, these points disappearing off the bottom of the graph. They were the milk fats. Evershed now had a tool to look for evidence of milk in the ancient pots. He hoped that the tight pores of the pottery material would preserve the milk fats. To find out, his team grinds up pot sherds. And analyzes them with gas chromatography and mass spectrometry, just as they did with present day animal samples. Evershed's detective work paid off. Right where contemporary milk fats showed up, there was now data from ancient pots. They once contained milk. African settlements 7,000 to 5,000 years ago were using dairy. And potsherds from Europe and the Middle East showed milk used 9,000 years ago, the oldest ever discovered. The dates reach back almost to the dawn of civilization. Geneticists can date the origin of mutations by analyzing DNA. Remarkably, the dates from when the European and African lactase persistence mutations first spread in populations 
are a good match with the archaeological evidence of when people first started using milk in these regions. How did dairying drive the spread of the lactase persistence mutations? Mutations, of course, occur at random. So before humans kept dairy animals, if a mutation arose that maintained lactase production, it could have vanished from the population. Without milk around, there's no known advantage to the mutation. But if such a mutation existed when we started dairying, then it could have increased in frequency in the population because lactase persistence now provided a selective advantage. I spoke with Mark Thomas to find out just how powerful that advantage was. Mind-bendingly strong. The estimates are put, put somewhere around 5 or 10 percent. Let's just say that it's 5 percent. What that means is that for every person, you know, for every, um, uh, you know, 100 people who would have survived without this trait, 105 would have survived with this trait. Um, and multiply that over a few generations and... And that's every generation. And it goes yeah. generation, generation. You know how quickly generations happen. And why? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, look, I've got some ideas. Well, I mean, look, so what are your ideas? Naturally, we have to start first with just basic nutritional facts. So milk is very protein and fat rich. Both are good for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. The protein in milk is of the highest quality. It's the only food that we're aware of that was produced with the intention of being consumed. Mm -hmm. All other foods generally want to avoid being consumed, <laughs> whether consciously or otherwise. That's true, that's true, yeah. Milk is a relatively uncontaminated fluid, and so it reduces the exposure to pathogens and parasites. You have these populations, they're moving into northern Europe. They're primarily not lactase persistent. Now imagine your crops fail. Now you become entirely dependent on your, on your milk. If you are in a famine situation, so you are borderline starvation, and you eat something that gives you diarrhea, you're probably gonna die. Yep. And that's exactly the thing that's gonna happen to these people, because they've, they've, got, they've got nothing else to eat, and they're eating more and more, effectively, toxic food. So I suspect that that's the real times that sorted out the lactase persistent from the lactase non-persistent. While the exact selective advantage of lactase persistence is still being debated, it's clear that the nature of this selection was unusual. It's a rare but powerful case of what's called gene culture coevolution. To understand our biological evolution absolutely requires an understanding of our cultural evolution as well. And that means that the human story is more a gene culture coevolutionary story than it is for any other species on Earth.